I am so glad you have chosen to join me today here at Bible Essentials and at my kitchen table. I've got my hot matcha green tea and I hope you have a tea or a coffee with you this morning. But most importantly, I hope you have your word because we're going to need it. We are diving into 2 Peter chapter 1 today, but to set the stage, we've got to know that Peter was written, they feel, in 67, 68 AD. And what makes this more interesting is that they believe Peter died in 68 AD. They believe this letter was written right before his death. Also keep in mind that this letter was written about three to five years later from when the first letter was written. So a couple years had passed and Peter is, is looking at his death in the face. And so what does Peter have to say in his second letter? Well, open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1 and let me begin to read. It says this, Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal privilege with ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that word obtained is means received by lot or chosen by lot. So this goes very much with the beginning of 1 Peter because remember he said you were chosen by the foreknowledge of God the Father for obedience and for the sprinkling of blood. Same kind of concept, those of you who have been chosen by lot a faith of equal privilege with ours through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of our God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, for his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. Stop and think about that. They were chosen by lot. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. Now remember, in the first letter, he kept saying, yes, you're suffering for a little while, but you've got to continue to live godly lives because people are looking at you. You're living amongst the Gentiles. Your life should reflect your knowledge of me. Remember that? Until Christ comes, live godly lives. Be holy because I am holy. He's saying that God's divine power gives us the ability to, for life and for godliness. This is important as we move forward and even as we go into chapter 2 next week. Oh, it's good. Um, okay, through. How does he do this? Through the knowledge of him. Through the knowledge of him. Through knowing God. And a big part of knowing him is knowing his word, understanding his word. That's why I'm so passionate about studying his word and his word alone. He who called us by his own glory and goodness, verse 4, by these, his own glory, his own goodness, he has given us very great and precious promises. Well, just go through scripture and underline everywhere where God promises something, eternal life, um, all these promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature. And that word divine mean is godly, God. Nature is inherent nature or origin or birth. 
So it's saying it's by his power he's given us the ability to live godly lives. He has given us through himself the ability to have a godly nature. Okay, what does this nature do for us? Remember, we're born again. We're a new creation. Look at this. It says, verse 4, By these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. If you have God's nature in you, then we shouldn't be tempted by the evils of this world. Verse 5. For these, this very reason make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, loving other Christians, and with love. Verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, if you have these qualities and you're growing in them, they're increasing, listen to what he says, they will keep you from being useless or unfaithful in the knowledge, or unfruitful rather, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Or Let me read this again. Verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, we can have knowledge of Christ. We can know our Bibles. But does our life reflect that in godliness, in knowledge, in endurance, in brotherly love, in love. Verse 9, the person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your calling and election because if you do these things, you will never stumble. Therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Well, how do you do this? He's saying, if you do these things, these qualities up here, and you're increasing in them, then you know. Look, verse 11, for in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly supplied to you. Interesting. Verse 12, therefore, I will always remind you all about these things, even though you know them and are established in the truth you have. I consider it right as long as I am in this tent, in this body, in this tabernacle, to wake you up with a reminder, knowing that I will soon lay aside my tent, as our Lord Jesus Christ has also shown me. And I will also make every effort that after my departure, you may be able to recall these things at any time. And I'm assuming he's speaking of this letter that he's writing to him. When Pat Peter dies, they'll have this letter to go back to as a reminder of what he's taught. Turn with me to John chapter 21, verse 18. Verse 18, I assure you, this is Jesus speaking to Peter when Jesus was still on the earth during his ministry. It said, I assure you, when you were young, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie, will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to signify by what kind of death he or Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. In that good, in Peter's death, his death, Peter's death glorified God. Tradition tells us that 
Peter was crucified upside down at his death. Moving on then to verse 16. For we, now he kind of changes gears here. It says, For we did not follow cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Well, what is he talking about here? He's talking about Christ's second coming. Remember, last week, we talked about in chapter 5 about how Peter was a participant in that. We're going to dig a little deeper here and see this firsthand. It says, Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, a voice came to him from the majestic glory. This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. And we heard this voice when it came from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transformed in front of them and his face shone like the sun. Even his clothes became as white as the light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Then Peter, our fearless leader, said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you want, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. Listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell face down and were terrified. Then Jesus came, came up, touched them, and said, Get up, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except him, Jesus alone. And they were coming down from the mountain. Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. At this time that Peter was seeing Christ transfigured in his glorified body, he was not sure really what he was seeing. He didn't understand it. Yet when he writes this letter, he does. He gets it. He gets that he was seeing Christ, that what he's going to look like in his second coming, kind of a preview of Christ's second coming. So look at this in verse 19. So we have the prophetic word strongly confirmed. He has seen it. You will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dismal place. Until the day dawns, the light breaks the darkness, and the morning star arises in your hearts. And I tried to get so deep right here in this verse about the morning star, but I don't think it's as deep as I was wanting it to be. I looked up morning star. Of course, we know Jesus is considered the morning star. Satan is called the morning star. Angels are considered stars, called stars in the Bible. But I do believe in context where these people are just being told, Christ is coming in his glorified body. He is going to shine like the light. And you need to keep this in mind and remember that we have seen it. Until he comes, you remember this. Verse 20, and first of all, you should know this. No prophecy of scripture comes from one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, moved by the Holy Spirit, men spoke from God. Now remember, this letter was written three to five years after the first letter when Peter kept saying that Jesus is coming, suffer until the end leading godly lives because he's coming for you to restore you and strengthen you. It's been three to five years later and under Nero, persecution has amped up and Christ still has not come. And so I believe Peter is, is addressing this, absolutely addressing that why 
yes, Christ still hasn't come, but he's encouraging them. Now, next week in chapter 2, it is supposed to be controversial. It can be, but I don't believe it is at all. I believe chapter 1 sets up chapter 2 perfectly. I so hope you will get your coffee, get your Bible, and join me back here at my kitchen table next week. I'll see you then.